Welcome to episode two of Nation Rising, our documentary on Lummister history. In the first episode, we covered the formation and settlement of Lummister's mother town, Lancaster, during the 17th century. In this episode, we will see how Lummister was carved from that mother town in 1740, and we will get a chance to examine the early development of our community, Lemonster. As the 17th century faded, it was clear that the new century would bring an epic struggle for the mastery of North America. That struggle would be among the English, French, Spanish, and of course, the Native American populations. The Native Americans were struggling against all odds to hold on to their way of life. Clashes between France and England on the European continent would spill over to North America, and some of those wars would pit English colonists against the French and Indians who controlled large swaths of Western lands that menaced the English colony's hold of the eastern seaboard. Increasingly, the Native American population became a pawn in these fights to control the continent. The taking of Native American lands was not accomplished by forced displacement only. The process involved some complexity. While some land was occupied by force, other settlements occurred in a vacuum. Still other land acquisitions happened as Indian tribes were thinned by disease or the rightful providence of God, some pious English acknowledged in the heathen suffering. There were also purchases of land from Native Americans. The people of Lemonster long prided themselves on the noble way that Indian land was acquired for their town. In his 1852 History of Lemonster, David Wilder noted, it must be a source of satisfaction to the owners of real estate to know that they acquired it honorably, paid for it honestly, and obtained a good and sufficient title to it. In 1701, a group of Lancaster men purchased 50 square miles of land from the Sagamore of the Nashua, George Tahanto. From this additional grant, as it was known, was carved Lemonster and other towns decades later. But did the white men really buy the land? Or was this a transaction more like the purchase of Manhattan Island by the Dutch? This is the grave of Deacon David Wilder, who in 1852 wrote a history of Lemister. And in that book, he took specific pride about how Lemister was acquired. It was a source of pride and a source of satisfaction to the early Lemister residents that the land that Lemister was carved from was purchased from the Native Americans as opposed to being taken from them. In 1701, certain Lancaster men, uh, Nathaniel Wilder and John Houghton, purchased 50 square miles of land from the Native Americans. The deed was signed by George Tahanto, the Indian sachem or chief. It was interestingly witnessed by Mary Osconomog, who was a Native American woman. And the deed recited that the former sachem, Sholin, was paid 12 pounds at some prior time, that a Native American by the name of Quinnipa, or James Weiser, was paid 46 shillings at a prior time, which converts to two pounds and six shillings. And those two men, Houghton and Wilder, promised to pay an additional 18 pounds to George Tahanto and his people. The responsibility for surveying the land was the Native Americans. They were supposed to have it done in four months, 
and have it formally incorporated um, into a precinct of land by the general court. It never happened. The surveying and formal incorporation of those 50 square miles of land called the additional grant as part of Lancaster did not occur until 10 years later. So one has to wonder how much of the 18 pounds the Native Americans were actually paid because in the deed it references that some of that 18 pounds was not paid at the time but was secured on a future promise. Assuming that the Native Americans between consideration paid already, the 12 pounds and the 46 shillings, and some portion of the 18 pounds was paid at the time of the deed, let's say 15 pounds was collected in total. If you're wondering what that was worth back in 1701, that's about three cows for a piece of land from which ultimately Leminster, Sterling, Bolton, West Boylston, Boylston, and Stowe were carved from. So I submit to you, well, it might have been a purchase. It uh, wasn't a very good bargain for the Native Americans. During the early years of the 18th century, the English colonies hugging the eastern seaboard were growing steadily. By the middle of the century, they held a population advantage of 1.5 million to a mere 60,000 Frenchmen occupying the Western territories. The competition for North America would reach a critical stage, but before that, the English living in more compact colonies were spreading out especially over the rocky soil of the province of Massachusetts. Larger towns divided into small ones, and families set out subscribing to own plots in previously unsettled areas. This was true in Lancaster as well. The first English settlers who came to the additional grant, uh, or that portion of the additional grant that ultimately became Lemister, were Gershom and Elizabeth Houghton. And this monument represents that settlement by those, that intrepid young couple back in 1725. Their homestead was a short distance from where this stone was placed. And this marker was originally on Hill Street, but moved a number of years ago and was uh, placed by Lemister Historical Society in 1910 four years after the Lemister Historical Society was formed. By 1737, the settlers of the northern half of the grant began to clamor for the right to govern their own affairs. In those days, that included not only secular matters, but also the godly shepherding of souls. In fact, going to meeting was not an option. You had to go to meeting. And the northern half of Grant settlers, uh, which would ultimately be Lemister, had to trek all the way to Lancaster to go to meeting, which involved, for many, traversing Bee Hill, which you can see in my background. That was a long, arduous trip, especially in the wintertime. In colonial Massachusetts, the chartering of new towns was not a matter to be taken lightly. Nonetheless, the perseverance of the future inhabitants of Lemister was ultimately rewarded. In early June of 1740, a petition was presented to the Colonial Assembly to incorporate the new town of Blank. Just a few days later, on June 23rd of that year, the town of Lemister was formally chartered, becoming the 151st town of Massachusetts. Interestingly enough, when the calendar was changed by the British in 1752, the incorporation date of Lemister became not June 23rd anymore under the old style calendar, but July 4th under the new style calendar. In that year, 1752, September 2nd was advanced to September 13th.
Imagine the government taking 11 days out of your calendar, but that's what happened in 1752. So Lemister has this unique, if not ahead of its time, incorporation date of July 4th. There are a lot of speculations as to how Lemister got its name. We all know that there's a Lemister, England, and we all presuppose that Lemister, Massachusetts was named for Lemister, England. But the finer question is why? A number of years ago, myself and colleagues from the Lemister Historical Society, along with staff from Lemister Access Television, visited the state archives in Dorchester, Massachusetts, looking for clues to that question. I'm here today with Jennifer Fosmith uh, at the Massachusetts State Archives. And Jennifer, um, your duties here are? I am the supervisor of the reference desk. So I am the person that people contact when they have questions about how to access our collections, what we have, um, how they can be used for research, and coordinating visits and that sort of thing. And uh, very cooperative and wonderful people, I might say, because I've used Thank this you. <laughs> services in the past. Thank you. And uh, very much appreciated. Um, today, in particular, we're here from the city of Lemister, mm -hmm. and uh, you've been kind enough to produce a document for us. Um, and this is part of your collection. Indeed. And uh, this is a pretty typical document, I would imagine, in, um, in the archives. Yes, yes. This is the um, what we call the Engrossed Act, um, which is the legal act, legal document um, that was produced by the legislature, signed by the governor, um, the Senate president, and the Speaker of the House. And this particular document is um, regarding the incorporation of Lemonster. This was... Um, signed on um, June the 23rd, uh, 1740. Um, can you tell me what kind of uh, paper it's on? Um, that is parchment. It's actually animal skin. And if you look closely, you can sometimes see um, where, um, and it may be a little gruesome for some, but um, where perhaps a rib bone or a hip bone might have been on the, on the um, located. Um, but yes, that is animal skin. The uh, interesting thing about it is that this was before there was a calendar change. Um, so when you add those 11 days, Lemister actually, ironically, uh, under the new style date, uh, is incorporated on July 4th of uh, 1740, which is kind of interesting. Um, it, it's, it's a remarkably preserved, preserved document. Is that uh, in part because of the material that it's on? The material, certainly, also the vault um, conditions that we have in place, which are environmentally controlled um, to keep the humidity and temperature and light levels stable um, and low. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, in part due to the materials and in part due to the, the conditions. In fact, aren't, aren't some documents that are on uh, more acidic uh, forms of paper, in some cases that are a lot more modern than this and mm -hmm. more difficult condition, correct? Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Uh, the papers particularly produced during um, World War II, 1940s, 30s and 40s, are particularly acidic. Yeah. Um, something you would think would be much in much better condition is not necessarily the case. Well, it's certainly a privilege to uh, have the ability to um, be able to view this document. And uh, thank you very much today for uh, helping us with this, uh, um, you know, this bit of filming and, and having the document available for us. It's uh, our inspiring as a resident of Lumista to be here and to be able to look at uh, the actual legal document that created a, a political subdivision, if you will. It's an amazing thing. It was a pleasure to have thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank Appreciate you. it. There is really no conclusive theory on how Lemister, Massachusetts ended up being named after Lemister, England. However, at least one theory has been advanced that is plausible. The affable Fritz Weatherby of the New Hampshire Chronicle show has theorized that three towns, Lemster, New Hampshire, a different spelling of the word Lemister, Pomfret, Connecticut, and Lemister, Massachusetts were all named for the Earl of Pomfret. Well, it turns out that the Earl of Pomfret was Thomas Femor II, Baron of Lemister. And this title and peerage that he received in Great Britain was something, of course, that proud people took uh, lots of uh, great measure in. And it is thought that he 
the Earl of Pomfret had some connection perhaps with Jonathan Belcher, the royal governor of Massachusetts in 1740, and this was a way of honoring the Earl of Pomfret by naming these New England towns after him. So once you have a charter, that doesn't mean you have a town. So there were settlers, of course, already in Lemister at that time. And those settlers who now were in the newly incorporated town uh, got together, but not until December 15th, 1740. Why December? Well, during the better weather months, of course, they were busy tending to their flock, their crops, clearing fields, all the things you need to do to survive in 1740. When the weather gets a little colder and uh, those kinds of activities are hampered, that's a good time to have a town meeting. And that's exactly what happened. So so they got together at Benjamin Whitcomb's house in December of 1740, uh, who lived at the time in the King's Corner section of Lemister, and they voted on some things initially, and one of those things was to create a meeting house, because back in 1740, paying homage to God was vitally important for a, a town, because Back in those days, of course, the secular government and the minister were all sort of one and the same. So they voted to build a meeting house, which got underway finally in 1741. By the time Lemonster's meeting house was finally finished, Great Britain and her English colonies were on the precipice of war with France. In 1753, America's future founding father, George Washington, was sent by Virginia's governor to warn the French out of the valuable Ohio Valley. The French ignored the mission, and Washington was sent to Ohio country the following year with 150 Virginia militia under his command. The Virginians won the first skirmish, but the French returned and forced Washington surrender, ironically on July 4th, 1754. The fighting ignited a world war. Fought on the continent, on the sea, and in North America. Called the French and Indian War in North America, the war was known as the Seven Year War in Europe. The British shifted their resources away from the fighting in the West Indies under the capable leadership of William Pitt, who came to power in 1757. The British resources were concentrated in Canada, and once that happened, Louisbourg fell in 1758, Quebec the following year, and finally Montreal in 1760, effectively ending the war in the North American theater when the French flag flew over Canada for the very last time. The war went on for three more years globally until the Peace of Paris was signed in 1763. Lemonster men, like other colonists, made significant contributions to the war effort, something that the mother country had complained was lacking during prior North American conflicts. Benjamin Whitcomb was the second born of 16 brothers and sisters. Lemonster's first town meetings before the meeting house was built in 1741 were held in his parents' home. Young Benjamin, at 18 years old, saw his first active service under the command of General William Johnson in 1755. Whitcomb saw action in an expedition against Fort Frederick at Crown Point, New York, as well as the Battle of Lake George, which resulted in the building of Fort William Henry in 1755. Two years later, Whitcomb helped defend Albany 
and New England's western flank when the French gained control of Fort William Henry. At a mere 21 years old, Whitcomb was enlisted in the company of James Reed for service with General Jeffrey Amherst, who will forever be remembered for purposely providing Native Americans with blankets infected with the smallpox. Whitcomb's service continued until the French surrender of Montreal on September 7, 1760. The young men that witnessed the historical shift of power and the changing of a continent was three years old when Lemonster's earliest leaders met in his parents' home. In time, Whitcomb would play an important role in another North American war. There, he would be fighting the British, not fighting alongside of them. Other Lemonster men marched, 36 strong, on the alarm of threat to New England, once the French were in control of Fort William Henry. Among them, Colonel Oliver Wilder's men was Lieutenant Luke Richardson. Lieutenant Richardson also served at the Battle of Lake George. Richardson was the son of one of Lemonster's earliest settlers, James Richardson, who was the second owner of a home which came to be known as the Old Abbey. Now gone, it was near the intersection of Fruit Street and Lindell Avenue in Lemonster, and was built by Josiah White with three-inch planks from his sawmill. Luke Richardson's son left the following recollections about a year before his death in October of 1863. When my father and mother commenced housekeeping in 1758, it was in the house with grandfather, James Richardson, one of the early settlers of Lemonster, where they continued to live. The first settlers in those days were compelled to endure sufferings and hardships far beyond any that were endured by the early settlers in the far west. They were surrounded not only by the wild beasts of the wilderness, but by the still more ferocious savages. At the approach of night, they took refuge in some garrison, if one were near, otherwise, they took into the house with them every deadly weapon, guns, axes, scythes, pitchforks, clubs, everything that could strike a mortal blow. While hoeing in the field, their big dog would sometimes fly to the brow of the hill and bark loudly, with hair bristled up. The dog undoubtedly scented Indians in the swamp for their foot tracks were discovered in the cornfield after the corn was fit to roast, and in the winter, when our people went to the swamp to obtain wood for fuel, they would find logs partly burned, where Indians had roasted corn. There was a spot on the hill, as one goes to the swamp, where I have counted twenty or thirty Indian corn hills at a time. Tomahawks, scalping knives, flint arrowheads, stone hoes, stone chisels for cutting ice, and other native implements were found long within my remembrance. If those were not times that tried men's souls, and women's also, I have yet to learn what could be. I'm here at the final resting place of Green Richardson who was Luke Richardson's grandson, the French and Indian War veteran. This stone has a very interesting story. A number of years ago, when I was in here doing some historical research, this stone was not where it was supposed to be. It was taken out and it was being used by some people that shouldn't have been in here. Um, and the police intervened and um, there was an arrest, unfortunately. And uh, ultimately, this stone ended up in an evidence locker at the police department. Sixteen years later, I got a call from the detective who said they had a gravestone they didn't know what to do with. So I asked him to give me the information, and he sent me a photograph of it. And I said, I'm sure that that stone belongs in Pine Grove Cemetery someplace. And I did the research, and I found out where it belonged so that the DPW would know where to place the stone back. So 
young Green Richardson, who died as a as a young fellow, um, didn't have a stone for 16 years, and I forgot um, when I was con contacted by the detectives that I was the, actually the person who called to notify the police that the stone had been essentially taken from where it belonged. Um, stone's also interesting because the original um, inscription says that Green died in 1777, but if you look carefully, the inscription has been corrected uh, manually to show that his date of death was June 9th, uh, just before the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1775. Of course, that's when that battle occurred. Um, he was only one year old, um, one year, eight months, and 13 days old at the time of his death. And I'm heartened that his uh, stone has uh, been returned to its uh, proper place, uh, even though it was absent for so many years. Before Lemonster's charter was 20 years old, early days of amity within the town gave way to troubled times. According to David Wilder's account, The Reverend Rogers was a scholar. He was a studious and learned divine. But whether at the time of his settlement he was quite as orthodox as he had been recommended to be by the neighboring ministers, or whether by diligently searching the scriptures he had discovered more truth, which, as a faithful minister of Jesus Christ, he considered it his duty to communicate to the people of his charge, or whether a portion of his people, and especially some who had come into town after his ordination, were inclined to stick fast where they were left by Calvin. That great man of God, who saw not all things, are questions upon which it does not become me to express an opinion. I'm speaking to you from Lemister's Pine Grove Cemetery, and I'm standing next to the final resting place of Lemister's first minister, Reverend John Rogers. Back at the time that Rogers was ordained, in 1741, this was the center of Lemister. In fact, the meeting house was located to my back uh, and built during that period of time and stayed that way until 1774 when Lemister Center was moved to where it is today. Reverend Rogers had a rather uneventful first 15 or 16 years as Lemister's minister, but by 1757, he started to espouse theory that troubled a lot of Lemister's churchgoers. In essence, he believed that Christ was not a deity, but a prophet. And this was sort of the Unitarian thought process. He was quite, kind of ahead of his time in that regard, but this didn't sit well with many of his fellow Lemister churchgoers and they started to watch him very carefully. We advise the said aggrieved at the present, and for the space of three months at least, to attend upon their said pastor's ministry, and to hear him with candor, waiting upon the God that hath the hearts of all men in his hands, to give them relief in such way and manner as shall deem best to him. But if, Upon so long attending and waiting, they find no alteration in your pastor, handling the important doctrines of religion, but that he still goeth on propagating his errors, or give no satisfactory evidence of his change of principle. We advise that you renew your application to the council by the moderator, or if it be in the providence prevented, then the next eldest minister or the eldest scribe for further advice. They started to investigate him. In 1757, July to be exact, they put together a council of churches. 14 separate churches from the area got together to review the case. And by early 1758, in January, he was dismissed as Lemister's minister. Christian friends and brethren, I lament that we must be separated. I suffered and toiled with you to establish this church. Most of those who laid the foundation of this altar of God in the wilderness will stand by me. My enemies are mostly those who came among us as strangers, 
whom we welcomed with a Christian affection to our table of communion and house of worship, but who have now ungratefully, like the serpent in the fable, bidden their benefactor. The council too, which have advised you to this course, are not free from guilt. Some of them, and not a few, think as I do on these very doctrines, which they pronounce so fatal, and which they call upon me, in the pitiful tones of children, to renounce. I forgive them their sin. May God forgive them. In 1759, Reverend Rogers filed a lawsuit against Lemister, and that lawsuit ended up getting settled by 1761. And part of the settlement of that lawsuit was to allow the setup of a separate precinct in the community for Reverend Rogers' flock in a separate precinct for Reverend Gardner, who was the second minister of Lemister for his parishioners. Reverend Rogers' people went to North Lemister, and that's how North Lemister was created, as a separate precinct or as a separate part of Lemister. Reverend Rogers preached until 1788, and some of those years from his parsonage in North Lemister. So it was that Lemister was divided into two separate churches, two separate precincts, all the way from 1762 formally to 1788. Lemister's was ultimately reunited in 1788 under one church in one precinct under Francis Gardner, who was the successor to Reverend Rogers and Lemister's second minister. I am here on Main Street in North Lemister and I'm sure you can hear some of the traffic in the background. This is a pretty heavily traveled road in Lemister, also known as Route 13. And I'm guessing that many of you may have traveled this way hundreds, maybe even thousands of times in the past without knowing the significance of the structure behind me. That building was once the parsonage of Lemister's first minister, John Rogers. Reverend Rogers was dismissed as the Lemister minister uh, by the end of 1757, and he was prohibited from using the meeting house in the center of town. This ultimately led in 1761 to the creation of a separate precinct for Reverend Rogers to preach in, which became North Lemister. For seven years, Reverend Rogers preached in the parsonage which is behind me. Uh, this building has been here, obviously, for a very long time, and I'm going to guess that most of you had no idea that the central role that it played in Lemister's history way back in the 1760s. Um, just another little part of Lemister to discover. Lemister, like other towns, had issues to deal with that extended beyond its borders in the mid-1760s as well. The French and Indian War had cost the British government a princely sum, 140 million pounds. And the thought in London was the colonies should share in the burden since half of the money spent was to defend them. After all, those resources directly benefited the American colonies and their pent-up desire to grow westward. But there were circumstances to contend with in taxing the colonies. In 1763, the British issued a proclamation that prohibited settlement beyond the Appalachian Mountains, at least temporary, thrusting the hopes of many land-hungry colonists. The war convinced the colonists that their military strength was formidable in North America and that the British were not invincible. The Americans started to see themselves as separate, something that truly started when pilgrims first stepped off the Mayflower in 1620. The cost of defending the colonies did not end with war, and the British government eventually created a plan 
to force the colonists to defray the cost of their own security. The plan would change everything. <laughs> 